Hello and welcome back to Battle Lord Modded. We're going to be fighting against this particular army of the Lake Rats right here. This is going to be a pretty simple fight, but there's an army over there right by the side of our newly conquered town, and we obviously want to try and prevent that from being taken. But that is another problem entirely because I don't have enough units to be able to handle that guy. So I really don't know what I'm going to do about that. Maybe I'm just going to have to let the town be taken and then just take it back at a later point. I can only hope that the garrison that I've placed there, or should I say that the garrison that my companions and my, uh, mm, the, uh, I guess the lieutenants of my army have placed in there, is going to be enough to diminish their strength significantly so that we can potentially do something against them when the time comes but yes i'm not holding out too much hope for that it's one of those things you know it's one of those things where you just go like ah cross your fingers and hope that that's going to make a difference uh well i guess we'll see anyway the war exhaustion for the batanians is becoming a bit of an issue we're getting close to 60 value on the batanian side and obviously that doesn't really that you know to be fair it doesn't really make that much difference it doesn't really affect them in their daily operations so it doesn't affect how fast or how slowly they get into a battle or anything like that the only thing that really matters is the binary number so if, if for example it's zero then obviously they're still going to be at war and if it's at one then they're going to make peace and that's exactly what i mean it's either on or off that's pretty much how it goes with war exhaustion at least that's my that's my analysis of it so far it hasn't really shown me that War Exhaustion does anything to their behavior in general, so we shouldn't have to worry too much about the War Exhaustion unless it reaches 100. Which of course is something that we want to try and maximize on. We want to try and capitalize on maximizing the amount of time and the amount of damage that we can potentially cause in the time that we have available to us. Because once it reaches that value, it's good night because they will be making peace and then we will be unable to take anything from them. So this army appearing out of nowhere right now, it's kind of bad. It's kind of bad because that does make it so that they are diverting my attention away from the most important goal of all, which is of course to try and eliminate the entirety of their faction, which, well requires me to take a bunch of their stuff yes <laughs> i mean i know it's uh, it's kind of shocking right yes it's kind of shocking that i would need to take their thieves but yes that is what i need to do and unfortunately it seems to me like that's going to be a bit difficult gonna be a bit difficult so we'll see we'll see what happens with that but for the moment i think we should be all right as long as we uh, maybe you know what maybe what i can do is i can just leave this town and I can literally just go and I can, I don't know, take something else. But that's also another problem because if I do try to take something else, it is going to result in me not having enough units to be able to pull it off to begin with. That is the main issue there. That's the reason why me having this army right here is really kind of harsh because they seem to have gotten the, the timing down exactly right because with the amount of units that I have offloaded into the garrison at the town, which obviously I will be unable to access now, even if I were to go into the garrison here and pull them all out, it's going to make no difference whatsoever because I'm going to have to pass through enemy lines and, well, that's going to prevent me from entering for free, so to speak, because otherwise we're going to have to pay some kind of toll and it's going to, you know, eliminate a whole bunch of my, my units and so on. So it's really going to be a bit of a mess. So I guess the best thing that I can do is head back to the nearest town that I have available to us, which I assume is probably going to be Pencanok. It might be Pencanok or Maranath or something like that. Do I, do I even own Maranath, by the way? I seem to remember that I, I took it or maybe didn't take it. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm going to try and figure it out after this and we'll see what happens I'm, I'm thinking i might have to get out my crossbow to deal with this guy yep seems like i might have to there we go nice hit right there i'm actually kind of surprised that i'm doing so well with my crossbow on horseback i mean i i kind of i really should expect it by now shouldn't i you know being relatively decent at crossbow skill and uh being able to utilize it as i wish that's uh, yeah it's pretty good not too bad not too bad 
And I'm going to go zoom zoom mode right now. There we go. That's it. Last enemy has been eliminated. And there we go. We lost a... Uh, we actually lost quite a few units right there. But uh, obviously I did decide to go in for a charge. The main reason why I decided to do that is because the enemy was acting way too defensive. Way too cautious. And I really wanted to just, you know, rush them as fast as I possibly could. And get the battle done and over with. Anyway... I have a pretty decent amount of units in my own army, in my own party, should I say. As you can see, I have um, 153 plus 55, so that's pretty decent. But my friends here, they are not looking so good, as you can see. This guy has 28 and this guy has 54, so it's really not very good at all. Anyway, you can see here, there's the war exhaustion, it's at 57 right now. Sargeth is right over there. Marinath, that is actually my thief. So I'm going to go over to Marinath... <laughs> Marineth. No, it's because I, I literally looked at Sargeth and I was like, Marineth? No, it's Marinath. Marinath, yes. Mm. Anyway, we're going to go over there, try and get into the garrison really, really quickly. And hopefully in that time, this army is not going to be able to capture that that fast. Hopefully they're going to capture it fast-ish, but not that fast. Uh, yeah, well, we could only hope. Anyway, we're just going to take a bunch of units out of here. I'm going to take all the tier 5s. Actually, you know what? I'm going to take the tier 4s as well while I can. And then we're going to go and we're going to take all of the tier 5s and tier 4 archers. And there we have it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so that's going to leave the garrison relatively bare bones, unfortunately. But we really do need to give our people some more troops. And this is really going to make a huge difference to them in the long run and I'm actually thinking that I might agree with some of you in the comments really because I think um, I think one of you in particular did say something like why don't you take the lower tier units and you're talking to me in this case why don't you take the lower tier units and put them in your own army because you probably have better skill in leveling up units than your companions do and as a result they're gonna be more efficient and better in in battles in comparison to well, them not having those. So yeah, generally that might be an idea. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to swap out all of these lower tier units. And as you can see, he's he's got a whole bunch of tier ones and everything. And we really don't want him to have tier ones. I mean, that's, that's absolutely awful, isn't it? So what we're going to do is we're just going to give him a whole bunch of these. Just going to give him a massive amount of really, really good troops. And while he stays in our army, it should be absolutely fine for us to do this. And there you go. Okay, so that's pretty decent. I feel like that's not too bad. And I'm going to leave him with about that. Maybe we'll just give him some pike users. And that's it. That's what we're going to do with him. So he's got a whole bunch of really powerful units now. So he should be absolutely fine. And now Bothero needs to have something too. So what we're going to do is we're going to give him a whole bunch of pikemen, shield bearers, and some really good archers as well. So let's do that. There we go. Okay, uh, we'll give him these two. And yeah, I think that's about about all that I can really give him. So we'll give him those as well. All right, so let's go back into Maranath now. So what we're going to do is I'm going to mostly keep all of the units that I already have. However, I am... Uh, oh, I haven't actually set these to any particular training path. That's the reason why they're not actually leveling up. So let's see, what am I going to do? Well, they can either level up into Raiders and become Falksmen, or they can level up into Trained Warriors and become Oathsworn eventually. I think Oathsworn are probably going to be the way to go. So Trained Warriors is exactly what we're going to go for. And we're going to go for Warriors here as well. There we go. Okay, yeah, that should be perfectly fine. So that's what we'll do. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put all these guys in here. So generally, every single lower tier unit we're going to put in there. And then we're literally just going to go back into the garrison. And I'm just going to fill up my army with tier 3, maybe tier 4 units. Now it seems like tier 3 is all I can really do. So that's what we're going to go for. I'm going to go for Axemen, Trained Warriors, and what else do we have available here? Vagia Archers. And I think that's pretty much all I can take. I mean, I can take a couple more, but that's basically it. Maybe I can take a... Oh, look at this, look at this. Ooh, nice. This is actually looking pretty good. I'm going to take a couple of these. And there you go. That's all I can really take. So, nice. So, what's, what, what's going to happen now is that hopefully 
these units are going to level up relatively quickly and then they're going to become just that much more powerful you know if you strike me down i will become more powerful than you can possibly imagine and so on you know you know that quote don't you you should know that quote surely anyway uh unfortunate uh, oh no actually there is enough nice there is enough great okay so i can actually sell all that that's really really nice and I'm actually thinking that what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell a lot of the lower tier weapons right here as well. Because even though these could be smelted down and so on, I kind of want to get rid of a bunch of these. Because they are taking up a huge amount of inventory space. And I kind of would like a little bit of extra cash rather than actual smithing materials. So that's what I'm going to do there. Anyway, we have a decent army. Yes, we have an actual decent army if you can believe it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make our way over to uh, Kerb and Seth, and maybe, just maybe, I might be able to get there before it is taken. Oh, they haven't even gone in yet. Are you serious? Why would they Why would they do that? Look at the gar The garrison's actually pretty good. Look at that. 238 defenders. I'm kind of surprised about that, to be honest. Okay, well, let's see here. Uh, yeah, this is just a singular path, and that is perfectly fine. All right, no problem at all there. Okay, so otherwise, we're just going to... Oh, there's another another siege going on there. Are you serious? Okay, apparently there are two sieges going on. I'm just going to go here real quick and sell our prisoners so that we can move around a little bit faster because prisoners do make a big difference to your movement speed on the campaign map. We do have to bear that in mind. All right. Let's see now. Okay, so he's attempting to take this with 214 units. They've now gone in to the uh, to the battle here at Kerban Seth. I'm thinking we're probably going to stick around here. Because if we stick around this big army, they're, they're eventually going to lose enough. And we have Becerra's army coming in there as well. And look at this. This is exactly what I was talking about. Look at how many units we've lost from the garrison here. It is negligible. It is really nothing. And two armies bearing down on this guy, he cannot escape. There is nothing he can do to escape this right now, unless he is just generally faster. Oh, of course he's faster. That is so incredibly infuriating. Oh, well, never mind, never mind. So what we're going to do now, golden bread slicer, thank you very much. And I'm going to go in here. 252 units. Ah, there's another army right there. Ooh, they've got, they've got some pretty good units. Look at that. They have a lot of, a lot of armies running around and everything. They have um, some pretty decent numbers all over the place. So I'm a little bit worried about this, especially considering... Look at this. There's another one. Do they literally have three armies right now? Let me just take a quick look. Uh, can I not tell? Apparently I can't tell. Hmm. I thought I was actually able to tell that before because you can see maybe here uh, how many uh, how many armies they had or do I have to go to actual armies or something? I, I'm not entirely sure where I could see that before because I seem to remember that there was a, a, a readout or a display that was actually giving me an idea as to how many armies a particular faction had but apparently I cannot find that anymore for some reason. Okay, well, we don't seem to have anyone else that we can really do war against. So we are stuck with Batania for the moment, which is absolutely fine, because we're going to lead the assault here against this particular castle, and then hopefully we'll be able to stay inside the garrison while this army just moseys on by. We're not really going to bother them too much. And hopefully we'll be able to uh, take care of this without too many difficulties. Obviously, we do have a bit of a problem with some weird... We had freezing in these sieges. No idea why that even happens, but hopefully it's not going to happen too often in this one. And I will be able to get a couple of either either extremely funny kills or extremely cool kills. Either one. Anyway, I'm just going to shoot this guy in the face. There we go. Take that. And this guy as well. Oh, he moved right at the last second. How dare you? There we are. Okay, where's the other guy? Yeah, there's another one. Oh, wow. That guy actually survived. If you can believe it. I could not believe it. Because I'm, I'm usually able to kill people in one hit with this crossbow these days. But I hit that guy in the abdomen and apparently that was not enough. Apparently that just was not enough power behind the shot. Maybe it was too far away. Maybe uh, our bolt lost a little bit of its power over the travel time 
through the air. And bear in mind, it is snowing. And, I, and as I was mentioning in the previous episode, if weather effects do have an impact on ranged um, ranged capabilities and, and, you know, how effective your ranged attacks actually are, then snow is probably going to make a pretty big difference. Or at least I think it should. Anyway, let's have a look what's going on here. Nothing? Really? Okay. Apparently there's nothing going on here. Very intriguing. Oh well, never mind. I really like the lighting, by the way. The way that they've done the sort of natural lighting effect so when you know when the human eye goes into a dark space you can't really see and obviously it is a kind of exaggerated version of that because of course if you go from an extremely light area like this is and then go into a dark area then you're never really going to be able to see within a couple of seconds you're gonna yeah, it's gonna take a bit of time to see unless there's obviously a bunch of light coming in from somewhere but i really like that effect that's one of the effects that i think is super super fun especially when you come outside as well it feels very very realistic in that sense because you think to yourself oh look at that it's like being in a completely pitch black room and then going out into wherever and then it's super super light and it's got that same kind of feeling so they've really done a good job on that anyway gonna try and rain down some death and destruction on the opponent here i'm not entirely sure why my forces are having so many difficult did I really just shoot my own guy? Yes. I think I did. Let's just ignore that for now. Yes, let's just ignore that. Okay, I'm just going to try and get into some... A uh, little bit of fisticuffs right here. So I try and eliminate these guys. And... Oh, it seems like we have them on the run. Look at that. We have them on the run. Fantastic. Whoa, that guy... Are you serious? Rodox Sergeant Pikeneer? That is absolutely useless. Is that not useless? Do you not think that that particular usage of the pike is going to do nothing i mean have you seen any of those guys get kills in the top right i don't know whether i have i'm gonna you know just out of pure interest i'm going to take a look and see whether those pikeneers have actually gotten any kills because i'm pretty sure they will what they actually have gotten kills i can't believe it Wow, okay, uh, that's actually really impressive. I would not have expected them to get any kills whatsoever, but as I've said before, the AI is very good in terms of their timing, and polearm attacks especially are very effective for them. So that obviously makes a big difference. Anyway, let's uh, wait here for some time. Let's see what this army's going to do. He's obviously going to move on, which is what you would expect him to do. And now we have Bothero leaving behind a bunch of units, as you'd also expect. Is he? Did he really leave behind these units? Are you serious right now? I'm I'm literally thinking I will go in here. Can I not go in here? Oh, that is annoying. If I don't claim it, then I cannot go back in and take those units back. But as you can see, he's basically put in 39 extremely high tier ranged units right there. And I'm thinking to myself, did you seriously just do that? I'm going to slap him, you know? I'm going to slap him across the face right now. And I'm going to be like, what are you doing, sir? What are you doing there? That is absolutely awful. But, oh well, never mind. I guess he leaves a couple of units there for a good reason. And I know he means well, but it really does not help me in the least. Okay, I think I'm... Is he... Oh, that was close. Okay, I thought to myself, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to wait and see whether he actually starts to close the gap. And if he started to close the gap between us, I was going to leave the siege immediately. And that was even before the first initial setup of our siege camp was ready. But as I said before, we really do need to get a move on with this. Anyway, we have the final perk for our one-handed weapon proficiency. Each skill point above 250 grants you 0.2% attack speed and 0.5% damage increase with one-handed weapons, which is pretty good, I gotta say. That's pretty good, but again, I think you'll probably already know what I'm about to say, so I won't prattle on about it, but generally, passive skills like this, I don't get that excited about them because they are just that. They are very passive and they don't really change the way that you play the game at all. 
And as I've said before, more RPG elements, please. That would be fantastic. I'm obviously not entirely sure if they're going to be adding anything like that in the future versions, because I haven't really taken a look at any of the change notes or anything like that, because I only really do that when I eventually get round to updating my game, which will happen when a new series is started. And uh, do bear in mind that obviously that very much depends on how effective we currently are in our attacks against the enemy here. Because as I've done in previous series, usually it is a good idea to ascertain whether you are powerful enough to pretty much capture anything else that you set your mind to. So for example, if you do a really, really difficult siege, so if you do a siege that has over a thousand units or 800 at least, and you are able to achieve victory in that siege, then it's more than likely you're going to be able to take pretty much anything else in the game and then it's just a formality that you're going to be capturing the entire map. And that's, that's generally the criteria that I use because if I don't do that, then it's just going to be repetitive, you know? It's going to be repetitive, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, I just took that again? Okay, well, there you go. You know, it's that same kind of thing. Obviously, right now, in this episode, we're focusing on slightly weaker thieves because I don't really want to be in a situation where I end up in such a place where my army cannot run away because they just have so few units or anything like that, and I'm a bit worried about doing a large siege because of that. So I'm kind of targeting the weaker ones because then it's going to, well, it's going to give me a pretty reasonable distraction for the opponent to focus on, hopefully. And then it's also going to give me an idea as to what I'm actually going to be capable of in those sieges as well. So obviously we've already seen that I'm capable of dealing with about 400 to 500, maybe even 600 units in a town siege, which is pretty good. That's not too bad, but of course... That is with some very high tier units. And because I've given those high tier units to my party members, they might give, give them away a bit too much. And so my army may end up being much weaker than it would have been otherwise. So we'll see what happens with that. But generally, yes. I'm thinking we might very well be close to a point where I should be able to pretty much deal with anything. And we might even want to uh, test our metal against that Batanian army that is right outside. But of course, heading into this particular siege, it's going to lose me more pe more people. It's going to lose me more people, and I'm not really going to be able to do too much to uh, change that. Because there is no setting to stop those guys from donating those units. It's just automatic, so that might be a bit of a problem. But we'll see, we'll see. And maybe it would be quite fun to try and take on an army like that. But we've done that in the past and we've been pretty, pretty successful. So we'll see. Anyway, let's see if I can maybe do some damage here and survive being attacked by potentially six units at once. Nice. Anytime I can get killed like that, that is a nice little miniature victory for us. Get him. Ah, oh, he's running. Are you serious, sir? You're outrunning me, and that's very embarrassing for the lord of his party. So I will just shoot you and have done with it. There we go. And uh, as you could see right there, I had to actually tell, on my, tell my forces to charge because they were just not doing anything else. That's the problem, obviously, with, with not building any other siege equipment because it seems to me like if you're able to maybe build those siege towers or at least the battering ram and then get the main gate down it makes things much much quicker and simpler for your units and their pathfinding as well so their decision making is a lot easier yeah those guys are dealing with some stuff over there i'm gonna yeah nice snipe right there nice um yeah hello there what are you doing what are you doing get get back there we go he's dead okay fantastic so I'm just going to move on down here. Let's, uh... This is, this is kind of a cool siege, i got to say. I actually feel like this map is probably one of the best that I've seen so far. This is looking really, really fun right now because there are so many different little areas where pockets of enemy units are. And you having to fight through 
a variety of different environments as well because you have the courtyard, you have the battlements, you have these little areas like you know that can be used for archery nests and things like that. You have all those different places and you have to adapt to fighting on stairs, on certain elevations, and on walls, and obviously not, you know, slipping off and dying, because that happens to me almost all the time. Ah, there we go. Take out that guy. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I mean. So th this is probably one of my favorite siege layouts so far, I've got to say. And obviously I've, I've played the game for many, many hours so far. And generally, I would say that this is one of my favorites. Maybe, maybe, maybe my my favorite ever? Hmm, not entirely sure about that. But I always love these multi-stage sieges. And uh, there's obviously a lot of really cool innovation in mods from Warband in regards to that as well. So, for example, um, if you know the... The uh, Japanese-focused mod, Gekko Kujo. If you know that mod, then props to you, because that's an absolutely fantastic mod. If you are into uh, sort of ancient Japan, feudal Japan sort of time. But generally, that mod incorporates, or I think was one of the first to incorporate multi-stage siege mechanics into Warband. And if you think about that, that's pretty insane. That's pretty innovative as well, because initially, no mods had any kind of um, any kind of unique siege mechanics whatsoever. They they usually used the default siege mechanics, or they just changed um, you know how things interacted with each other and so on. Britain Water is another one of those, which is a little bit different, where they actually allow you to have more options on the campaign map, and some of them are different in the way that they handle things because obviously their maps are different their their you know their layouts and things like that are different but Gekko Kujo was one of the first to do the multi-stage siege where you do the the first stage where you're outside the walls and you have to try and survive against the numerous amounts of archers that were firing at you you had to fight in the courtyard and then you could progress to the next stage and then the final stage with all of the units in their central keep area and this was all in one seamless level as well. It was not a, a case of, you know, loading or, or zoning into any particular... <gasps> okay. Ah. Oh, that's really bad. Oh, dear. Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked. I've never seen my brother's army, or should we say, I've never seen my brother be killed ever before. Obviously, Heroes Must Die is enabled, so of course, you know, it is possible, but I have never seen that before. And that's, that's saying something. That is saying something like no one's business. Because I've, I've played the game for a huge amount of time. And as I say, I've seen a lot of different situations. But never this. That is actually amazing. Okay. Well. Hmm. I'm not entirely sure what to do. Because I now have a bunch of units... And I am over the capacity. Ooh. Uh, the one thing that I can do is I can go to Kerban Seth. I will try to run. O okay. Uh, y y no. No, that's not going to happen. Okay, so we're going to have to do a fight against... This guy, who does not respect the fact that our brother has just perished. Of course, why would he? I mean, really. You know, all's fair and love and war, I guess. If you if you must. But uh, uh, anyway, that's going to be it for this episode. A <laughs> little bit of a cliffhanger there for you. And so I thank you very much for watching. And I'll see you next time.